Welcome to the Microsoft IT Pro Podcast, a show about Office 365, Azure, and the IT Pro and end user side of life. Each week, we'll discuss a different topic or recent news related to Office 365 and Azure and how it relates to you as an IT Pro. The MS IT Pro Podcast is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. All right, so here we are again, another episode of the podcast. And this week, I'm actually flying solo from the perspective of, I don't have Scott here with me. So he's hmm. got caught up in some work stuff. They're doing a bunch of construction on his house. If you listened a couple of weeks ago, they had some hurricane damage that had to get repaired. So you just have me. But fortunately, I was actually able to get Steve Peshka to come on the podcast with us too. So we're going to actually talk to him a little bit today about monitoring. So before I get into that, just an intro. Steve is one of the founders of Office 365 Mon and an 18-year veteran of Microsoft. So while he was at Microsoft, he spent the last dozen years working almost exclusively with SharePoint, Office 365, and the Office 365 dedicated teams. So it included uh, significant work helping with some of the large enterprises, governments, military organization design, deploying, developing on different versions of SharePoint, going all the way back to pre-release versions of SharePoint 2001. So he's been working on it even longer than I have. In 2015, Steve left Microsoft, helped start up Office 365 Mon. And now it's one of the market leaders in monitoring Office 365. So he's got a long history of monitoring it. And you guys just spun up two Azure service mods. So Office 365 and Azure now, you have over 2,000 customers and just continuing to grow. Steve's the CEO now, frequent speaker at a variety of Microsoft events over the years and still continues to blog at SAMLman. So that's samelman.wordpress.com. Anything else, Steve? Again, glad you're on the show. Anything else you want to intro everybody on, talk about? I think you covered pretty much everything. That's my life in about two minutes or less. Yeah, so <laughs> All you right. got it covered. Sounds good. So let's dive into the topic today. Considering you have Office 365 Mon and Azure Service Mon, we do cloud stuff, we're IT pros. We figured right. why not talk to you about some of the at least start with some monitoring and security from your perspective, kind of what should people be looking at there? What should they be paying attention to when they're trying to monitor some of these cloud services? It's obviously a lot different than what you may experience on-prem because you don't actually have the servers. Yeah, and you know, that that's kind of funny. Going back to when we started Office 365 Mon, kind of an interesting change in perspective, if you will, from kind of what our goals were when we started to where we're at today. And and what I mean by that, you know, one of the big drivers when we were first thinking about Office 365 Mon was really in looking at the service level agreements that Microsoft provides for Office 365. And, you know, they guarantee 99.9% .9 uptime. And if they fall below that, then you're entitled to a, a refund of some or all of your Office 365 fees for that month. And so that originally was actually our focus for the service. What's interesting about it and really kind of the where the transition came is as we were talking to the IT pros at these various enterprises that were interested in doing monitoring, I would say maybe one in 10, if that, were really interested in the refund part of it. Um, really what they were interested in is, you know, hey, we, you know, it's like we've had, you know, all these on-premise services for many years. We have uh, lots of tools in place, lots of people and processes in place. And, you know, we get it. We understand those things that we need to do in terms of managing our on-premise infrastructure, you know, knowing what's going on with it. And it's like you say, you know, then they move to the cloud and it's like, okay, we have no visibility to anything. We really don't know what's going on, who's taking care of it, if there's a problem. You know, it's really pretty tough to, to understand that. And so that really became and has become far and away the number one thing that we hear from customers when they're looking at cloud monitoring are all our stuff, you know, all our important services are running up in the cloud or, you know, in a hybrid situation, but a big part of them are running up in the cloud. And we really feel like we have no visibility, no, you know, into what's going on up there. And so that was uh, has become really kind of the big reason why folks start to look at us. I mean, you'll get some 
some information from Microsoft will always provide some of that. But what companies like Office 365 want to do is we really build and expand on that significantly. And so that's an important aspect of it. For a lot of other companies also, they look at it as she, along the lines of, you know, We want something that's independent of Microsoft, basically like, you know, third party verification or validation where Microsoft says, you know, hey, the service was up, you know, 99.98% of the time or whatever. They want someone that doesn't necessarily have a vested financial stake in the availability of it to come out and put its kind of stamp of approval on, you know, whatever those numbers may be. So that's kind of the, you know, kind of the drivers that get a lot of folks going. In terms of what to look at, you know, the security is actually a really big deal. And the reason why I say that is because, again, you sort of think about it, you know, in the on-premise world, and you control everything. You control the environment, you control the directory, you control the physical access, all of that stuff, right? And when you move to the cloud, it's kind of turned on its head. And so what we see from our perspective, when we're looking at how to manage, you know, monitoring for another company, you know, we have a pretty strong philosophy of at least privileged access when we're trying to manage monitoring. So, for example, when we do monitoring, all of our monitoring, every single bit of monitoring we do is all uh, the authentication and authorization is all managed through Azure Active Directory. So, we're always going to go through them. We're never going to ask you for a username. We're never going to ask you for a password. We're not going to store that anywhere. But And we compare that uh, and contrast that to a lot of other monitoring companies out there that will do things like ask you for a username and password, and then they'll go store it somewhere in their you know site. And you have to hope that they take good care of it. You know They don't have a rogue employee. They don't get their data breached. Uh, and then your data goes along with that or your you know user credentials go along with that. We've also had uh, seen other you know monitoring solutions where the, you know not only do they want a username and password, but they want a username and password of a global tenant admin. <laughs> and when you do that, yeah, you've given them the keys to your kingdom when you hand over that hand over those set of credentials. We've seen other companies that say you know right up front, well, we want access to every single mailbox in your organization. And I think that's just kind of crazy. Like I would never, I mean, think about all the important and confidential information, right? That flows around your organization. And I would never, you know, hand over that, that level of control or access to someone. So we start, like I say, we're always with Azure Active Directory. The other thing that's cool about it that a lot of companies can't do that that we can do because we do that. If you're using things like multi-factor authentication, that just works with us. If you're using things like ADFS on-premise, that just works with us. But any of those things, you know, that you use in conjunction as additional security measures, all of that just works with us. And then finally, you know, because we're using Azure Active Directory, when we go out and and we say, you know, you ask us, you know, hey, go monitor this SharePoint site for us. And what we'll do is at that point, we'll redirect you over to, to Azure AD and Azure AD will say, you know, hey, is it okay if Office 365 mom monitors this thing for you? And it's asking for these set of permissions. And, you know, assuming you say yes, you know, we get back a, a token that we used uh, to really connect to that resource, but it's done so in the context of a specific user, whatever that user was, you know, that was logged in when you said, you know, hey, go monitor this stuff for us. So what that means is why that's important then from a security perspective is because what we, again, sort of thinking least privileged access, what we recommend to folks is to say, hey, you know, go create a separate account that's just for monitoring and give it rights to basically nothing except for that stuff that you want to monitor. So set up a separate site as an example for monitoring or for email, keep it off all your global distribution lists because our access, because we're using Azure AD, our access to content is going to be in the context of whatever that user is. So if that user only has access to one site with you know no documents in it, then we'll never be able to have access to anything else beyond that. Those are some of the ways that we look at like least privileged access and how to manage security and really kind of our overarching goal, which we always say is, you know, you know, we don't ask for usernames and passwords. We don't store username and passwords. We don't want your data. We don't want to store your data. We want no responsibility for your data. It's really your data, and we're just trying to connect to the services and make sure that they're up and working. Okay, that makes sense, and that's that's really nice. For me, I tend to just look at the health dashboard, and I'm looking for those alerts from Microsoft that says, 
hey, something's wrong, something's not working in your tenant, something's maybe not quite... There's an issue with it. But there's been other times where something will be working, something's not right. And I feel like the first place everyone goes is they go hit Twitter. And they're like, hey, is anybody else having (laughs) this issue or that issue? So do you guys provide some of that more alerting? So maybe... I'll find out that something's wrong with my tenant specifically, or maybe I even messed something up where I won't get that same type of information from just watching what Microsoft is monitoring or alerting me on. Yeah, you know, that's actually a really interesting point and a good point. So first off, you know, we hook into the same sort of events and messages that you see in Service Health Dashboard. But what a lot of folks don't understand and, and get is there's, the way we talk about it is there's really two kinds of monitoring in that respect. There is what we call tenant level monitoring and what we call service level monitoring. So that stuff that you see like in Service Health Dashboard, that's really service level monitoring. And so that's, you know, information that's pushed out there by Microsoft uh, relative to the statuses of the different features and features in those services, but understand that that's really information about the service as a whole. And those sorts of changes, changes in statuses to those features and and services, those changes in statuses, it's a slow moving ship for someone for Microsoft to go in and change the status of those services. So, you know, for example, like uh, say an outage starts in Office 365, you know, what's going to happen is the customers are going to start seeing it. They're going to call Microsoft support, open tickets. They're going to start doing some triaging, try and figure out, you know, hey, is this a local network issue or is this an Office 365 issue? And there's going to be monitoring that, you know, some monitoring that Microsoft does mostly on the back end of the service. And it's going to start percolating up, you know, some data points around that. And then there's always an un- unlucky collection of people that are the on-call <laughs> team <laughs> for our Office 365. And so these data points will start flowing in there. And then those folks, it'll be up to them to sort of see, you know, okay, something's going on. They'll sort of triage that and decide, oh, okay, you know, something's happening here. It's reached a big enough impact that we need to go ahead and change the status in some way for the service as a whole. But that whole process, that can take a while, you know, from when a problem first starts happening to when the the status actually changes. It could be 45 minutes, an hour, a couple hours, whatever. And that's sort of the nature of service level monitoring. It's nice to have, but you need more than that. And so what we do to contrast that is tenant level monitoring. With the tenant level monitoring, you know, as the name implies, we're monitoring your specific tenant. And we're doing, we're issuing health checks about every minute or two. So we can find out if your specific tenant is having problems and we can let you know within a minute or two if you're having problems in your tenant. You may eventually see something come across on the service level side, service health dashboard, but there are other times when you may not because there are loads of times. I mean, there's almost always some tenant, one or more tenants having some kind of issue in Office 365, but it's not like, you know, the the status of the Office 365 services are in a perpetual repairing or investigative state. You know, you really need to have enough traction and impact to the customer base as a whole before those service statuses get changed. And so that's another reason why it's important to have tenant level monitoring as well. Okay. So do you guys go down even further than that, again, I've looked at your tool a little bit. I haven't used it a ton, but we're both SharePoint guys. We know how mm-hmm. easy it can be to throw some JavaScript on a SharePoint page and make a web part blow up or <laughs> install a web part and have a site actually blow up where SharePoint's still up, the service is still running, it's still showing as active in your tenant, but maybe right. one of your SharePoint pages just blew up on you? How, or even, I mean, something related to Exchange or Skype for Business where what level do you guys actually go down to at monitoring some of those different services? It varies. I would say for the most part, we do focus on the service as a whole rather than individual because trying to monitor, like for example, if we try to monitor every single page in every single site and every single site collection and a tenant, it would just not be manageable. It would be 
pretty much difficult, if not impossible, to really set up a set of monitoring thresholds that would make sense and to be able to, you know, reach out and talk to every one of those thresholds in sort of a, a time sensitive manner. So for the most part, you know, we look at it from the service level as a whole, but we do, there are some, you know, what we call uh, core features that we monitor on top of those services. They're not down to, you know, the level of, you know, individual pages within a site as an example, but they're really, you know, what we call, and kind of like you're alluding to, we call it, you know, the service is up, but it's not working, which is kind of what you just described. But we do that for a few of the things. So like for SharePoint, we do that for the search service. So we monitor the query and crawl on a SharePoint online site. List performance will monitor for large list performance issues, which actually is kind of a much bigger issue or more common issue than, you know, an individual page here or there. On the exchange side, we monitor for exchange transport issues at will. So transport issue, email transport issue would be, you know, again, like I can open my inbox and I can get in there and I can read my my email messages and ex- as an example. But if I'm sending email messages and they aren't going out, and being delivered, or people are sending me messages and they're not coming in and being delivered to me. Those are the kinds of scenarios that we talk about, you know, hey, the service is up, but it's not really working. Okay, very nice. We're going to take a quick break now. Hear a word from BitWizards again. A big thank you to them for sponsoring the show. And we'll be right back in a few seconds here with more from Steve. We'd like to thank BitWizards for sponsoring the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast. They've won Florida Trend Magazine's Best Companies to Work For eight years running and have been a Microsoft Gold Partner since 2001. Nobody loves Azure like BitWizards. BitWizards is looking for talented, like-minded IT pros with a knack for Azure. If you're listening to this podcast, you'd likely be a great fit at BitWizards. Just think, you could be listening to Scott and me on the beach. Go to bitwizards.com slash cloudsmith right now to apply. We're back. So in the intro, I mean, you guys have a lot of customers, 2,000 customers, and you're monitoring all of their Office 365 tenants. And you said a lot of these, you're hitting them like every minute or two. That sounds like you guys have to have quite, quite a system in place to be able to scale out, to be able to continue to bring on new customers and grow and have that level of monitoring. How do you support all of those customers? I'm I'm envisioning something in the cloud just because everything we're talking about is the cloud, but <laughs> I'm curious, how do you guys actually do it? We designed for scale from day one. And, you know, we kind of had a choice, like you say. I mean, when you think about the number of transactions that are involved there, we had a choice where, you know, we could try and hire a data center of about 500,000 people, or we could look to scale it up in the cloud. <laughs> and we decided to go with the, the cloud approach. So, yeah, so the way that we that we issue these health checks are all delivered by a set of services that are running up in Azure. And so we have various things that we've done from a coding perspective to kind of scale out the individual components and the way that they issue these health checks. And then on top of that, we also have some things that we do to scale them, the services themselves that are running up in Azure. So, you know, as a result, I mean, when you look at any typical day, I mean, we could have easily 100 uh, meg of content going back and forth. We could have, you know, a million or more uh, health checks going out each day. So there's really a huge scale factor there. And I tell you one thing where I will give a kudos to to Microsoft in this respect is the ability, at least from their side, to manage their services and not require sort of constant human intervention and uh, sort of monitoring the performance to determine scale, the way that they've been able to take the humans out of the loop, if you will, has really been outstanding. And so to the same, it's kind of like hair club for men, you know, it's like, you know, not only am I the president, I'm also a member. And it's the same sort of thing, uh, you know, with monitoring Azure and Office 365. I mean, as much as time and effort as we spend monitoring those, we're big customers of those services uh, as well. And and Azure is, has really been just outstanding uh, in terms of us being able to leverage that to monitor these services. That's awesome. So one question I have to ask is, 
how you monitor Azure with Azure. Because I think back to, it was Amazon, it was a few months ago now when I think their S3 storage went out and all the yeah. images that they used to alert people that the storage was out were actually stored in the storage that went out. <laughs> yeah. So nobody could actually see that it was out because the service to alert that it was out was actually out. So... Do you guys have some ways in place too, especially with the Azure service, man, to kind of keep them like in different regions or in different data centers to kind of help help with some of that? All of our services are kind of based on the the concept of splitting out the the services and the data across different data centers. So the idea that you know even if an entire data center goes down, our services aren't going to be dead in the water. And we've, like I say, we've had uh, really good luck with that. Our Azure services as a whole have actually been really reliable, but it has been, I will say, it has been interesting since we've turned on Azure Service Mon, you know, just, uh, we actually just released that, the initial release a few weeks ago, a couple, three weeks ago. Uh, and we have seen some instances where some of our Azure services <laughs> were going down unavailable. But, it, you know, what's great about that is it's it's good for us, you know, to be able, I mean, like any other company, right? I mean, we are built, have built our business on these Azure services, so it's critical for us to know as well. But what has been nice about it is even when we've had, you know, some specific services go down, our services are diverse enough in terms of being spread across these different regions that it hasn't impacted our ability to continue to monitor things. Very nice. I feel like Azure's done a really good job of that, of how they have some of those availability sets, um, some of the different zones. So they really do, it seems like, help help customers even be able to spread that out so you can guarantee that something, it's always going to be up somewhere. Right, right, exactly, yeah. So one other topic we wanted to dive into is you have monitoring, you're monitoring these tenants. Again, going back to Office 365, you have these tenants spread across different geographies. You may have different users that are distributed where you have users in Europe and users in the US and maybe users down in South America somewhere. And all these users are hitting Office 365 from their different locations. Is there a way that you kind of can even help monitor that? So when somebody would call, say, from Europe and say, hey, I can't get to the tenant, but maybe somebody in the U.S. can, or based on what the data center they're hitting, different, maybe even internet pipes they're taking, how do you guys handle kind of those distributed organizations that are distributed around the globe? Yeah, that's actually a great point. So, I mean, most of, if not all of what we've been talking about so far has really been based on these health probes that we issue from our cloud services. But kind of like you were describing, this came up early on uh, at Office 365 on from these larger enterprise customers that said, you know, hey, that's great, but, you know, here's the problem we have. You know, we have, it's like you said, we have, uh, as an example, we have customers in the U.S. and maybe, I'm sorry, users in the U.S. and maybe they're, they are experiencing no issues, everything's fine for them, that maybe we get calls from our users in Europe saying, well, you know, performance is really slow or performance is, you know, is, is down altogether. How are we going to deal with that? And so what we did to tackle that is we have a feature of our service called the distributed probes and diagnostics feature. Essentially what it does is it allows you to, it's uh, something that you can download and you can think of it like an agent for our service. And we let you download and install it in as many different locations as you want. So what our larger customers will do then is they'll, you know, install it in all of these different geographies where they have users. And when they install it and set it up, that agent, uh, what it does is it will connect to uh, back to our cloud service and it will talk to our cloud service periodically about once an hour or so and figure out, you know, okay, for this customer, what is it I'm supposed to be monitoring? How am I supposed to connect to it? All of that kind of stuff. And I'll pull that information down and then it will start issuing its own set of health probes from each of these different locations where it's installed at. And so that provides a couple of really interesting things. First of all, from a performance perspective, one of the things that you can do when you set up this agent is you can uh, set thresholds for uh, notifications based on performance. So for example, you know, in one location, you can say, you know, if it's taking longer than, say, 
15 seconds to execute these health probes, then send me a notification. But maybe if you have you know, a different region where your internet connectivity is much slower, um, you can change it. You can say, well, you know, if it, uh, for that specific location, you can say, you know, in this location, if it's slower than 30 seconds or whatever, then send me notifications. So it's a good way for you to keep on top of what the performance is like at different locations, different geographic locations throughout your organization without, again, having to wait for users to call and complain to you, hey, something's going on. And that's really kind of one of the big, you know, about monitoring in general. One of the big things that we talk about and look at is, you know, from an IT pro perspective, you really want to know about problems before your users call in and tell you. If your users are the ones that are letting you know, are you know, sort of your first alert that there's a problem, then generally that's not nearly uh, as easy to deal with uh, as if you know about it yourself ahead of time. And then when customers or users call in, you can tell them, okay, yeah, we're aware of that, we're working on it. And so that's, you know, a big positive for monitoring in general. So performance is part of it. And then outages as well. A great example that I'm sure a lot of folks that have been around Office 365 for more than a couple of years or so may recall is, you know, I think it was a couple summers ago or so, there were some big Azure AD outages in Europe, right? And from our perspective, when we're monitoring Office 365, if you can't you know, authenticate to Azure AD, then you can't get into Office 365. And so we consider that an outage. And so actually when that happened, you know, for our customers, again, their users that were in the US were having no problem, but their users that were over in Europe were having loads of problems. And so our customers at that time that had this distributed agent set up and running over there in Europe, they got those notifications right away that, you know, hey, there's a problem going on over just in this specific region that really wasn't impacted impacting, you know, the rest of their users worldwide. So that was, uh, you know, really kind of good use case and illustration for, for why you want to have those distributed probes out there as well. And then from a reporting standpoint, you know, in terms of what we do, the other thing that's kind of interesting with that then, as all of these distributed locations are issuing their, their own set of health probes, what they're doing is they're pushing the the data back, the performance and availability back to the cloud service. So then you can come into our cloud service and you can look at the various reports that we have and we can see what your performance availability is like from a geographic perspective across you know, your whole region. So that's another good way of looking at it. And another thing actually that's kind of interesting about that as well is in one of our report galleries, we have a subset of reports that we call our all-up reports, meaning it's data, anonymous data, that reflects uh, performance and outage characteristics for all Office 365 Mon customers. And so when you look at the heat map, we have a heat map of all of these different locations where people have dis- uh, installed this distributed probe. And it's really pretty interesting then because you can drill into you know, specific regions around the world because we have uh, folks that have installed this literally all over the world. And so you can drill down into these specific regions and you can see you know, what the performance is like for other customers that are in these other regions. And again, it gives you kind of a sanity check when you look at your own performance it's like well you know for other customers in this part of the world they're getting performance that looks like this you know and you can sort of say are we in line with that you know are we more or less seeing similar performance are we way you know out of bounds from that and if so you know maybe we need to look at you know what's our local network infrastructure like what's our local isp like those sorts of things yeah nice that so now instead of going to twitter i can just go to the heat map and see what people around me are experiencing. Exactly, exactly right. So is this, is the agent something that they tend to install like on a single machine or on a server in that region? Or do some clients like to put it on all of their users' machines so they can even get analytics on how all of each individual user is performing? Where does that agent tend to live? Yeah, you really wouldn't, again, want to, I mean, well, technically you could put it on every single user's desktop. It, you would, again, there's always a balance a balance between how much data you get and at what point that data becomes noise. And if you installed it on every single user's desktop, ultimately it would be noise. <laughs> there would just be too much data to try and filter through to make sense out of. So what Got most it. customers, yeah, what most customers do is, and really where it makes the most sense, is really just in a single geographic region. So they'll put it on a VM running somewhere or some machine somewhere. I mean, this is like a really super low impact kind of agent. So you can put it on, on virtual any machine. So most folks, they just spin up a VM or use an existing one that they're using for some other purpose and install the agent uh, on that. Okay. Sounds good. Well, that 
Already, we're at about our 30 minutes. So <laughs> it goes quick. Scott it and I does. say it every week. <laughs> before you know it, you're out of time. So we'll go ahead and wrap up. But before we wrap up, if people want to get a hold of you, Steve, or learn more about Office 365 Man or the Azure Service Man, what's the best way to contact them? I know we mentioned your blog at the beginning. Is there any other way they can kind of follow you, get in touch with you? You know, really just go to uh, office365mon.com. There's links on there for support. The support email, which is support at office365mon.com. If you email those guys, and if nothing else, if you want to get a hold of me directly, just email those guys. They'll forward, they always forward emails on to me, and I always, you know, respond to those emails. So they can get a hold of us in, in that way, and that's absolutely the best way. All right. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Steve. It was great having you on and learning more about Office 365 Mon and what you guys can do, and just about even monitoring. Office 365 and Azure as a whole. So maybe we'll see you around at a conference or get you on another podcast. We can dive into even more details sometime. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Ben. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Steve. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.